satisfied with just a cottage below a little silver and a little gold but in that city where the ransom will shine I want a gold one that silver In that bright land where we'll never grow old And someday yonder we will never more wander But walk the streets that are purest gold situated and if you want to take your Bibles go ahead and turn to James chapter 4 uh, James chapter 4 and we'll pick up reading in verse number 5 and then uh, we'll read down through the bottom of verse number 8 and then we'll pray and we'll talk about drawing nigh to God about drawing nigh to God and so uh, hopefully this will be a blessing to you but James chapter 4 let's pick up reading in verse number 5 uh, James writing to Jewish believers here and uh, chapter 4 verse number 5 we'll see here uh, there's a question given, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth us to envy? Uh, that's not the Holy Spirit of God, and that's the Spirit of the world that lusts and envy. And, uh, we have the Holy Spirit of God where there's gentle love, joy, peace, uh, meekness, gentleness, kindness. That's the type of Spirit that we should have as a child of God. Amen. 
But notice here, the spirit that dwelleth in us, lest us to envy. But he giveth more grace. And aren't you thankful this morning for more grace? Uh, beloved, are you, have you ever went through a circumstance or went through a situation? You just did not know how you were going to make it through. Yep. You sat there and your heart was broken into a thousand pieces. You were broken hearted. You were weeping. You were sobbing. And you couldn't even hardly hold yourself up because you were so weak from weeping. But God's grace is sufficient for us. Amen. And He gives us just enough grace when we need it at the right time. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. But He giveth more grace. Wherefore, He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And the key to this text here, I believe, is found here in verse number 7. All of this begins with this right here. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer, and ask the Lord to bless the reading of the Scriptures this morning. Dear, kind, and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I just uh, pray to you this morning, dear Lord, just thanking you and praising your holy name, dear Lord, for the wonderful testimonies that we've heard here this morning how you've worked and how you've blessed and how you've answered prayers in the lives of believers, dear Lord. And I just thank you and praise you for what we've already heard this morning in the Sunday school hour. Lord, I'm thankful for all the special music that we've heard here this morning. We are thankful for the place that you've went to prepare for us that when you come again, that when you come again, we have a place to go so that where you are, we can be there also. And Father, we just thank you and praise you for the breath of life you give us to enjoy creation today. We're thankful for the health you've given us and the ability that you've given us to come to your house, so to come together to worship thee in spirit and truth. And Lord, we are thankful for your word, for the instruction that we receive from your word. And Father, I pray uh, this morning that it would be all of our heart's desire, dear Lord, to be closer to thee when we leave than we were than when we came in, <coughs> Heavenly Father. Help us all to aspire to draw nigh to you because you've told us that when we draw nigh to you, you draw nigh to us. And so may it be our heart's desire to walk ever closer to you this, this morning, Heavenly Father. And Lord, I pray that you give me that anointing of the Holy Ghost to preach with clarity of thought and clarity of speech, to help me to be able to preach the truth in love. And Father, I ask and pray that you'd strengthen my stomach, my lungs, and my legs this morning. You know the weakness and you know the infirmities of my body, Heavenly Father. But, Father, my heart's desire is to stand for Thee and proclaim the gospel message and preach the word that You give me. And so, Father, I pray for anointing. I pray for strength. And, Lord, I pray that if there's one that's either watching this video or maybe one that's here this morning that's never trusted Thee as Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that You convict their heart of sin and judgment to come and draw them into Yourself and that they come forward today and be saved before it's eternally too late. And, Lord, we just thank You and praise You for what You've done. We thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. For it's in Christ's name we do ask and pray these things. And amen. amen. And notice here uh, in verse number 5 it says, Do you think the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace. And beloved, we should be thankful for abundant grace that's in our life. He is the God of all grace. And no matter what you're going through, whether it be a, a, a trial or a tribulation, or whether it might be battle and infirmity, or a financial a situation, uh, God with Him, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. And uh, beloved, uh, just like the Apostle Paul, when he was battling the thorn in the flesh, he asked the Lord three times to remove the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord's response to the Apostle Paul was that His grace was sufficient. And beloved, no matter what you're going through, you may not think it's enough to get through the time, but if you're a child of God, God is the God of abundant Amen. grace. He's the God of all grace. And His grace will be sufficient for you no matter what trial, no matter what circumstance, no matter what you're enduring in life. God's grace is sufficient. And, if, and He'll give you more grace and give you the type of grace that you need when you need it. He's never early. He's never late. But God is always right on time. Glory to God. Amen. And so uh, the text tells us here, But He giveth more grace, wherefore He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And beloved, we need to watch pride and how it creeps up in our heart. Uh, you know, it's uh, one thing for us to compare ourselves against uh, one another, and it's easy for us to lift ourselves up and uh, uh, put ourselves on a pedestal, but when we all compare ourselves to Christ, we miss the mark severely, do we not? 
And so, beloved, uh, it's one thing to compare yourself to somebody across the street that you live live to and the activities that they're doing. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, it ought to humble us. And, beloved, we ought to be thankful that our sins are saved. We ought to rejoice in our salvation. And we ought to be confident in our salvation. But we don't need to walk around with a holier than thou and a better than thou attitude. We're simply sinners saved by the wonderful, marvelous grace of God. Amen. Amen. And so, uh, beloved, uh, it's one thing uh, to be bold in the faith, but don't be cocky and arrogant. And don't put on a, an attitude thinking that you're better than everybody else because you're saved. Rejoice that your name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life. And be thankful that your sins have been, have been forgiven. Uh, but beloved, always maintain that humble attitude because you didn't do anything to merit your salvation. I didn't do anything to merit my salvation. Jesus Christ paid for it all on the cross of Calvary. His name is worthy to be praised this morning. He's the one that did it all. We just need to put our faith and trust in what He did on the cross of Calvary. And give Him the glory and praise that is truly due His name. Amen. And so, notice here, as we continue on reading, uh, but He giveth more grace, for uh, He saith, God resisteth the proud, but He giveth grace unto the humble. And the Bible tells us to humble our, ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And we ought to maintain that humble, meek, uh, quiet spirit uh, uh, that uh, uh, before God. Uh, because let me tell you something, if you start developing an attitude, if you start getting yourself above God, start getting yourself ahead of God, God has a way of getting your attention to humble you and to put your attitude back into check. And beloved, let me tell you something. I've been there uh, before. It's not a pleasant place to be. And He's got a way of getting your attention and hitting you in an area that will make you respond and repent and turn back to Him. Amen. Amen. And so notice here, as uh, we move on to verse number 7, and I believe this is the key to the whole verse right here, the first part. Uh, verse number 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. There are so many Christians today when I talk to them, they're telling God what to do. God, I want you to do this. God, I need you to do that. God's going to do this. God's going to do that. Now let me tell you something. The last time I read the Scriptures, and if I understand the Scriptures from King James Bible correctly, He is the shepherd and we are the sheep and we're not to tell Him what to do. He tells us what to do. And we're to listen and to obey what God tells us to do as His sheep, as a child of God. Uh, but there are some people that boss God around like they're bossing one of their employees around. Now let me tell you something. That's not maintaining a humble spirit before God. Uh, let me tell you something. When I go to the throne of grace, I ask the Lord, Lord, if it's your will, would you please do this? Would you please do that? And there's times that I don't know sometimes how to pray. And that's why I'm so thankful that the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit makes inter intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes I don't even know how to pray what's on my heart. But I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit does. And I say, I pray, Lord, not my will be done, but Thy will be done. You know, uh, somebody came by earlier this week and was uh, talking to me uh, about not giving up and then trying to give me a pep talk and encourage, uh, encourage me because uh, it is obvious that my health has diminished. It's obvious that I'm getting a little bit weaker and everything. And he wanted me to fight the good fight of faith, uh, to keep fighting, you know, to endure hardness as a good soldier. And I told him, I said, well, I said, I've not, uh, I've not uh, rolled up the white flag of surrender. I said, right now, I'm just weak. I'm just trying to pace myself, praying that the Lord will give me back strength. And he said, don't you believe that God's going to heal you? And I looked at him and I said, God has already healed me. Amen. He's already healed me. Well, you still got the cancer. Yes, I still have the cancer. But God has promised one day that this body of corruption will be changed into a body of incorruption and I'm going to get a new glorified body one day and I'm going to get a body just like He's got. And guess what? When that takes place, this old body will be healed. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be no more high cholesterol. There'll be no more high blood pressure. There'll be no more gastroparethis. There'll be no more kidney stones. We're going to that place with no more. There'll be no more sin, no more pardon, no more heartache. 
glory to God. And so, yes, through the eyes of faith, God has already healed me. Now, and I pray for a physical healing while I'm here upon this earth. Yes, I am. Uh, but His will be done. You know. And then uh, and He said, well, if you just had the faith of a grain of a mustard seed, you'd be healed. And I said, at the end of the day, I said, I have faith in God. But it's whether or not His will be done. You know, because I said, God has told me something from the Bible that you're overlooking. It's appointed a man once to die. Then after this, the judgment. And if we all live long enough, we're going to die. It's just that simple. We're going to die. And so I have an appointment with death. Now I'm hoping that the rapture of the church will take place before that time. But either way, I know in whom I believed in. And so, beloved, be sure of your salvation. Be sure of your salvation. Uh, that's one thing that the devil jumped uh, on my back about. Uh, 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 prayed for mom to be healed and for dad to be healed and for myself to be healed and God took uh, mom and dad home to be with him and uh, you know he, I know he's going to heal me through the eyes of faith one day he's going to heal me but I've been praying for an earthly healing and it hasn't taken place yet and the devil's like you've been told no 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 God's forgotten about you God's forsaken you he doesn't care about you anymore now let me tell you something the devil is a liar and the father of it he's nothing but a deceiver he's nothing but a murderer he's nothing but a liar don't believe a word that he says and so when he jumps up on your shoulder just take your hand and knock him off your shoulder and as the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. Talking about Jesus Christ. You know, He won the war for us, but there's still battles that we fight. And I've got good news for you. Jesus Christ wants us to win the battles just as much as He won the war for us. He wants us to win those battles that we fight on a daily basis as well. And so notice here, draw nigh, or excuse me, submit yourselves therefore to God. Submit yourself to the Lordship and leadership of Jesus Christ. If He says, Thus saith the Lord, then do, Thus saith the Lord. If He tells you not to do it, then you don't do it. But one way that we demonstrate and exercise our love for Jesus Christ, Christ said, If a man love me, he will keep my commandments. Amen. He will keep my commandments. And that's one way that I look at a person at a and a Christian engage their love for Him. Because we could never do anything to repay Him for what He's already done for us and what He's going to do for us. We can't pay Him back. And by the way, He doesn't ask for us to pay Him back, but He does ask for us to obey His commandments. And He commands us to do that. And that's how we can demonstrate our love for our Heavenly Savior. Amen. And so, uh, submit, uh, submit yourself therefore to God. Put God first. Matthew 6, 33. But seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. Always put God first in your life, on your job, with your family, with your marriage. Uh, if you've got hobbies, sports, vocation, whatever it may be, always put Jesus Christ Amen. first. Amen. The problem with America is America's got a priority problem. We want to put entertainment first. We want to put uh, 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 sports first. We want to put movies first. How about putting Jesus first? Amen. Amen. You know, uh, uh, we run here and we run and do that. Uh, then when something happens, oh my goodness, then we'll finally we run to Jesus. We ought to be running to Jesus first and staying with Jesus. Yeah. No matter what we're going through or what we're doing in life. Amen. Yeah. And so, uh, notice here, uh, submit yourselves therefore to God. Here it is. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. But notice here, uh, uh, this is part of the uh, 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 part of the condition, if you will, by submitting yourself to God and drawing nigh to God. There's some things we need to do. First thing we need to do is we need to cleanse our hands. We need to keep our lives clean in this world that we live in. That's why we need to keep our sin account short with the Lord, and we need to exercise and put First John one nine into practice. In our lives, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
And so uh, we, we're not of this world, but we do live in this world. And as we live on a day-to-day -day basis, our hands are going to get dirty. Uh, we're going to get dirtied up with sin, and we need that cleansing. If you're going to draw nigh to God, you need cleansing to take place in your heart, do you not? You know, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And if you've got sin in your life and God has called it sin, you're not in agreement with God, how can you draw nigh to God? And the only way that you can get close to God is to remove that sin, ask for His forgiveness, repent of it, and then the sin's out of the way, and you can get closer to Him then, you see. We see how this works. Uh, but uh, uh, you have to be careful about uh, sin in our daily life and activity. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? In other words, can you play with fire and not be burned? Don't play with sin. Don't mess around with sin. Stay away from sin. You know, keep yourself away from sin as much as you can. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, uh, one of my uh, per personal favorite uh, portions of Scripture. I try to have this hid in my heart. But in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, the Word of God tells us, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. In other words, do not put yourself in a situation where you can be hurt or where you can be burned by sin. Just stay away from it. You know, I hear these people all the time, well, I'm going to witness to my neighbor, and uh, he wanted to go down here to Charlie's Bar, and so I, I quit that drinking preacher, but I'm going to go down here to Charlie's Bar, and I'm going to witness to him. You do that enough, and Charlie will not only be buying your friend, or pouring your friend a drink, he'll be pouring you one as well. And you'll need to be trying to maybe get yourself back right with God also. And so the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse number 15, in relation to this world that we live in, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Titus chapter 2, verse number 12 tells us, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Teaching us. He's telling us this. He's commanding us this. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. And notice where this takes place at. In this present world. I have people come up to me and say, uh, tell me all the time, preacher, there's no way you can live a Christian life the way that the world is in today. Yes, you can. You just got to do it God's way. You got to do it God's way. You're trying to do it your way. You're trying to look for loopholes. You're trying to, you're trying to appease your own religious conscience. But if you'll just do it God's way, let me tell you something. Jesus Christ came to give us life and to give us life uh, more abundantly. He wants us to enjoy a little bit of heaven upon this earth and we can experience that peace which passeth all understanding and uh, we can have joy in our salvation, but we've got to do it God's way and that calls for holy, separated, sanctified, living unto God. That's the only way it's going to take place for the child of God to experience the, the fullness of the Christian life. And notice here, it says, uh, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, your sinners, and purify your hearts. We need to keep our hearts clean before the Lord, do we not? Amen. You know, uh, I'd like to think that my heart, uh, uh, my heart is, uh, is right with God, but you know what? We really just truly don't know how wicked our heart is until we're placed into a circumstance or a situation. I learned one thing a long time ago, never say never. I've had people tell me they would never murder and they'd kill people. I've had people tell me they would never steal. They lost their job, their spouse lost their job, and the next thing you know, you read their name in the paper where they were caught stealing, trying to provide food and put food on the table for themselves and for their family. You don't know what your heart is capable of. And beloved, God knows our heart better than we know our heart ourselves. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse number 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows your heart better than you know your heart. Amen. But beloved, it's important for us to keep our hearts pure before the Lord.
Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 9 says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin. The Bible clear, clearly is declaring all of us guilty before the Lord. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. We all stand guilty before the Lord. We all have a sinful, wicked heart. That's why Jesus Christ came and died on the cross. Glory to God. Amen. Uh, because of the wickedness of man. Uh, we read about this back over in the, the book of Genesis when God destroyed the earth uh, the first time uh, with water, with the flood. He saw that the wickedness of man was great and that the uh, imagination of his heart was only what? Evil continually. You know, and today you read the news and you get on Facebook and the internet and you see all the evil that's in the world today. And my goodness, God's Word is true. His Word is coming to pass. Evil man and seducers to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And we're living in that generation today, beloved. We're living in that generation. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And you can listen to a person's conversation and know where their heart is in about 10 minutes. What they like to talk about what they like to what they like to brag about, what they like to declare, that tells you where a person's heart at. There's been some people that uh, I've talked to that are Christians, and they never one time mention the name of Jesus Christ. They don't ever talk about the Lord. They'll talk about football. They'll talk about basketball. They'll talk about NASCAR racing. Well, did you say you were saved? Yeah, I'm saved. Hey, let me tell you about how many fish I caught. Let me tell you about how beautiful the mountains look. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with talking about those things, but as a child of God, we ought to be talking about Jesus Christ. Amen? He ought to be part of our conversation. He ought to dominate our conversation. And so notice here, uh, in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hand, hands defile not a man. In Acts chapter 15, uh, verses 7 through 9, the Word of God records and tells us, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts, and by the way, He knows our hearts. You can, you can, you can hide something from your spouse, you can hide it from the preacher, but you can't hide it from the Lord. Amen. You can't hide it from the Lord. And God which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost even as He did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And beloved, that's what happens when you get saved. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you've got a new heart inside of you that wants to live after God and live for God and stand for truth and righteousness. And friend, if that didn't take place when you got saved, I wonder if you got a heart conversion. I wonder if you got a heart conversion. And in Psalm chapter 24, verses 3 through 5 tells us, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in this holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul into vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. And then last of all, in regard to purifying your heart, we need to hide God's Word in our heart. Psalm 119, verse number 11, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. And going back to our text now, to draw nigh to God, uh, to draw nigh to God, He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. The word double-minded means setting a double standard. Uh, or I can use the H word here, uh, the word hypocrisy or being a hypocrite you know and how many people do we know well i'm not going to go down there to church with those hypocrites they're down there with nothing but a bunch of hypocrites but boy they sure don't have a problem sitting next to a hypocrite at dollywood they don't have a, a problem standing in the checkout lane at walmart with a hypocrite and they don't have a problem going to thompson bowling arena or needle stadium sitting next to a hypocrite you know, and by the way, I think Tennessee fans are the biggest hypocrites on the face of the planet. When they're winning, go Big Orange! And boy, when they get behind, get rid of him! Run him out of town! 
That is a double-minded man. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. It's that way in Rocky Top. If you're winning, you're a hero. First game you lose, you better have your house up for sale because they're going to run you out of town. I guess it's like that everywhere. I guess that's where we're at with sports at today. But my goodness. Uh, but the Bible tells us in James chapter 1, verse number 8, that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's that way in his marriage. He's in that way with his relationship with God. He's in that way with his relationship with his children. He's in that way on the, on the job. He's in that way about things, about, uh, about life. He's double-minded. He's uncertain. He's back and forth. He's back and forth. Hey, just get on God's side and stay on God's side. Amen? You know, the Bible tells us uh, about the warfare that takes place between the spirit and the flesh. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7 tells us, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. But the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's why it's important. When you get saved, you have two natures. you still got the old corrupt nature, but now you've got the new nature, which is after God, and there's a tug of war between those two natures. That's what attributes to some of our instability and our double-mindedness because some of the time we're feeding the flesh and then other times we're feeding the new man and we're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Hey, just feed the new nature and think about the new nature and uh, meditate upon the new nature and guess what? That tug of war will go away. That tug of war will go away and that double-mindedness uh, will cease to exist in your life. That's why Paul wrote to the believers in the church of Philippi in Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. When the devil attacks you, and when the devil starts trying to lie to you, think about Jesus Christ. Think about the cross of Calvary. Think about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Think about the promises of God. Think about that hymn that we sing, standing on the promises of God. Think about the old rugged cross. Think about amazing grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't think about what the devil's trying to fill your mind up with. Think about the things of God. Amen. Think about the things of God. It'll help remove that doubt and that depression. Trust me, I know, because I had to do this this past week. Past two or three weeks, I've been battling this. you got to get your mind on the right things. That's why the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Heavenly things. Spiritual things. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know, don't look around what's taking place around you. Keep looking unto Jesus, Amen. the author and finisher Pray of our faith. Keep looking unto Jesus. And then, you know, last of all, another thing that will help you with that double-mindedness, get busy doing something for the Lord. Yeah. Hand out gospel tracts. Be a witness. Get in your prayer closet and start praying. Start telling others of uh, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. But do something. Do something. Because the Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 3, this in closing, commit thy works unto the Lord. In other words, commit your actions to the Lord. Do something for God. Get busy for God. Now notice the result of this. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. When you start getting busy for the Lord and doing something for God, You'll be thinking, wow, I've done this, I've done this, and oh, the Lord laid this on my heart and my mind. I can go do this, and I can go over here, and I can hand out tracts, and I can go up here to the hospital, and I can go around and pray with those uh, that's in intensive care or up there in the waiting room, or I can take food and crackers up there and leave out gospel tracts, and you start thinking about all the things you do for God, you won't have time to think about anything else. Amen. Amen. You start getting busy for God, He'll start establishing your thoughts. You know, you've done this, you know what? i got something else for you to do. And when you get done with that, i got something else for you to do. 
And when you get done with that, I've got something else for you. Commit your works to the Lord and your thoughts will be established. But too many times we're like this. Oh, kick your feet up. You got to turn up. Watching that TV. Too much idle time. Let me tell you something. There's a lot of truth in this saying. An idle mind is the devil's workshop. Keep your mind busy. Keep your heart busy for the things of God. Amen. Amen. Well, that's all I have for us this morning. I hope the message has been a blessing to you. But at this time, I'd like to invite everybody, if you would, to stand, please. Everyone's standing. Everyone's heads bowed. Everyone's eyes closed.